Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be covering chapter 4 for our MCAT General Chemistry playlist. This chapter is titled Compounds and Stoichiometry and we're going to cover a couple of objectives. Objective 1 is titled Molecules and Moles. Here we're going to have a refresher on atomic structure and then we're going to define some important terminology and concepts. This is going to include a discussion on molecules and molecular weight, atomic mass unit and atomic weight, formula unit and formula weight, moles and molar mass, equivalence and equivalent weight, and finally, normality. Next, we're going to cover representations of compounds. So here we're going to define the law of constant composition. We're going to work with empirical and molecular formulas, and then finally, talk about percent compositions. The third objective is titled Types of Chemical Reactions. Now there are a few types of chemical reactions that we're going to cover in this objective and they are combination, decomposition, combustion, single and double replacement, and neutralization reactions. Then we move into the fourth objective where we will learn how to balance chemical equations. It's going to be super important that we master this because it will set us up for success in the chemistry portion of the MCAT. Then the fifth objective is about applications of stoichiometry. So here we're going to learn how to identify limiting and excess reagents and also how to calculate percent yield. The last and final objective is titled ions. We're going to go over ions, but the majority of this objective will actually be going over rules for nomenclature. We'll also end this section with just a brief discussion on electrolytes. With that introduction, let's go ahead and move into objective one, molecules and moles. And at the beginning here, we're going to have a quick refresher on atomic structure. Now, an atom, an atom is the smallest identifiable unit of an element. It is a neutral particle made of negatively charged electrons moving around a positively charged nucleus. Now, there are three subatomic particles that we're going to cover here, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Starting off with protons, protons are found in the nucleus of an atom. Each proton has an amount of charge equal to the fundamental unit of charge, which is about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. And we denote this as a plus one charge for protons. Protons also have a mass of approximately one atomic mass unit, and we can convert that to kilograms. It would be about 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now, neutrons. Neutrons are neutral. They have no charge. And a neutron's mass is only slightly higher than that of the proton. Now, taken together, the protons and neutrons of the nucleus make up almost the entire mass of an atom. Then, next up, electrons. Electrons, they move through space surrounding the nucleus, and they are associated with varying levels of energy. Each electron has a charge equal in magnitude to that of the proton, but with an opposite sign. So it has a minus one charge. All right. Now, keeping that in mind, the mass of an electron is so much smaller than that of a proton. We can compare the masses here in AMUs, or we can compare the masses here in kilograms. Now, because of this, because subatomic particles' masses are so small, the electrostatic force of attraction between unlike charges, take for example protons and electrons, is going to be far greater than that of gravitational forces of attractions based on respective mass. Now something to know about electrons is that they move around the nucleus at varying distances away. The electrons closer to the nucleus are at lower energy levels and those that are further out in the higher shells, they have higher energy. Now, taking that into consideration, let's also talk about a couple of important terms related to the atom as a whole. Atomic structure is defined based off of three critical numerical descriptors, atomic number, 
mass number, and atomic weight. Let's focus on atomic number and mass number for right now. So looking at an element on the periodic table, for example, here's a snapshot of oxygen from the periodic table. We can first cover atomic number. Now atomic number is often denoted as Z, and it is the count of protons in the nucleus of an atom. This number is fundamental because it determines the chemical identity of the atom. Each element on the periodic table is characterized by a unique atomic number. Any atom with eight protons in the nucleus is an oxygen atom. All right. Then we have the mass number. Sometimes it'll be represented with the letter A. All right, this is the total number of protons and neutrons in an atom's nucleus. Neutrons and protons are collectively known as nucleons, and their sum gives us the mass number. Now, the difference between the mass number and the atomic number is the number of neutrons in the nucleus. And it's important to note that the mass number is not the same as the atomic weight. Now, another way that you might see this information conveyed is in this form where you'll have the elemental symbol right here. And then in the upper left corner, you'll have the mass number. And in the lower left corner, you're going to have the atomic number. So for oxygen, if you were to write this out, you would write out O because that is the elemental symbol for oxygen. In the upper left corner, you would have the mass number, approximately 16. And here in the bottom left corner, you would have the atomic number. For oxygen, it would be 8. Now, before we get to the list of important terminology that we want to discuss, I want to talk about one more thing, and that is isotopes. Isotopes are variants of elements that have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons, leading to different mass numbers. Now, it's really important to remember that the mass number can be different, all right, but not the atomic number if you're talking about isotopes. So what that means is all oxygen atoms have eight protons. That's the definition for an oxygen atom. That's the defining feature of oxygen, that it has eight protons in its nucleus. However, the number of neutrons can change and thereby affect the mass number. And that's what we mean when we say isotopes. They're variants of elements that have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons leading to different mass numbers, not different atomic numbers. Now with that, what we want to do next is go over a couple of important terminology. And it's going to be really important for us to make sure we fully understand these definitions before we move forward. To start, now that we've talked about atoms, I want to discuss molecules and compounds. Students often ask about the difference between molecules and compounds, and considering that we've used this language up to this point, it really is important we understand the distinction between the two terms. A molecule is formed when two or more atoms are held together by covalent bonds, which occur when atoms share electrons. Molecules, they can consist of atoms of the same element, like nitrogen or oxygen gas, N2 and O2 respectively, or they can be composed of different elements, such as carbon dioxide, CO2. It consists of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Now, related to this term is molecular weight. This is the sum of the atomic weights of all atoms in a molecule, and its units are atomic mass units. And we're going to define atomic weight and atomic mass units here in a second. But in summary, a molecule is a combination of two or more atoms bonded covalently. In contrast, a compound is a substance that's composed of two or more different elements chemically bonded together. Compounds can form through either ionic or covalent bonding, and they exhibit a variety of properties. Essentially, all compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. Now, in this realm, it's important to remember 
that ionic compounds and covalent molecules differ from each other, and ionic compounds differ from covalent molecules in that they do not form discrete molecules due to the arrangement of oppositely charged ions in the solid state. Instead, ionic compounds form nearly infinite three-dimensional arrays of charged particles. So in the previous chapter, we talked about sodium chloride as an example. Each sodium ion is surrounded by chloride ions and vice versa, creating a coordinated lattice structure. And this makes it difficult to actually define a single sodium chloride molecule. And so consequently, the term formula unit is used to represent the empirical formula of the compound, and formula weight is used instead of molecular weight. And so formula unit, this is the chemical formula of an ionic compound that lists the ions in the lowest ratio that equals a neutral electrical charge. And formula weight is the sum of the atomic weights of all the atoms in the chemical formula of the substance. Now, the next thing we want to do is discuss atomic mass units, atomic weight, moles, and molar mass. Now, we already discussed this in chapter zero, but we're going to review them here as well. All right, so starting off with atomic mass unit. The atomic mass unit is a standard unit of mass that quantifies the mass of atoms or molecules, and it's defined as one twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. All right, now the carbon-12 isotope is stable, and this is the isotope of carbon with six protons and six neutrons. Its abundance makes it a standard for measuring atomic masses. Now, one atomic mass unit is approximately equal to 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now, the atomic mass of an element usually found on the periodic table, is expressed in atomic mass units, and it represents the average mass of all the isotopes of that element, taking into account their relative abundance. And that helps us transition into our next term, atomic weight. Atomic weight is the weighted average of the masses of all naturally occurring isotopes of an element, and it is measured in atomic mass units. Now, to calculate atomic weight, scientists consider both the mass and the natural abundance of each isotope of that element. Next up is moles. A mole is a unit that measures all right, is a unit that measures the amount of a substance. Just like the measure one dozen signals that you have 12 of some object, right? One dozen eggs means you have 12 eggs. One dozen books means you have 12 books. One mole of a substance, it also signals a measure of the amount of a substance. Specifically, one mole of a substance contains exactly 6.022 times 10 to the 23 entities. This can be atoms, molecules, ions, etc. Now this number, this number is known as Avogadro's number. And the mole allows chemists to count particles by weighing them. Now the mass of one mole of a substance is going to be equal to its molecular or atomic mass in grams. And the last thing that we want to define here before we take a quick pause and begin to connect some of these topics is molar mass. Molar mass is the mass of one mole of a substance element or compound, and it's expressed in grams per mole. And now that we've defined these terms, the next question we should ask is, well, how do we connect them all together? How do we connect atomic mass units, molar mass, and moles? And by that, I mean, how do we convert from one form into another? To answer that, let's start here. If you know the number of particles, you can convert that to moles by dividing by Avogadro's number. So you can divide by Avogadro's number. If you know the number of moles, though, first, and you want to convert to number of particles, you can do this by instead multiplying by Avogadro's number. All right, so that's that first conversion. All right, now let's say that you know the number of moles, and now you are interested in converting this to mass. How do you do, how do, you do that? How do you convert from moles to mass? You do this by multiplying by molar mass. And if you say, let's say you know the mass and you want to convert to moles, 
then all you have to do is divide by molar mass. Okay, now let's say, another scenario here, let's say you know the mass, all right, and you wanna convert that to number of particles. What are the steps to go from mass to number of particles? All we have to do is figure out all right, what the two arrows that lead from mass to moles is and then moles to number of particles. We have already talked about each of these as individual steps. Now we're just having a multi-step part to this. So going from mass to number of particles is going to involve step one, dividing by molar mass, and step two, multiplying by Avogadro's number. Phenomenal. Now let's say that you know the number of particles and now you want to convert to mass. Again, you're going to follow the arrows for these one step conversions that we talked about. And we're just going to use that to lead our way from number of particles to mass. So in order to do that, you're going to first divide by Avogadro's number and second multiply by molar mass. Okay, so now we talked about how we can convert from one unit into another. Let's take this information, all right, and do a couple of practice problems together. This first example asks, what is the molecular weight of thionyl chloride, SOCl2? Now, to find the molecular weight of this molecule, we're going to have to add together the atomic weights of each of the atoms. And we can get information about the atomic weights of each of the atoms from the periodic table. So in this molecule, we have one sulfur atom, and sulfur has an atomic weight of 32.1 atomic mass units. This molecule also has just one oxygen atom, and the atomic weight for oxygen is 16 atomic mass units. Now this molecule has two chlorine atoms. Each chlorine atom has an atomic weight of 35.5 atomic mass units. When we multiply that by two, we get 71 atomic mass units. Now all we have to do is add up these quantities together to get the total molecular weight, and that total molecular weight is 119.1 atomic mass units per molecule. Now let's go ahead and tackle this second example. This one says how many moles are in 9.53 grams of magnesium chloride? We're given mass in grams and we're asked to convert to moles. So let's go back up here to our table and let's figure out what we need to do to convert from mass to moles. In order to do that, we're gonna have to divide by molar mass. Now, one thing you're going to recognize is that we are not given the mass of magnesium chloride, but we can figure it out the same way that we did for this first example. So magnesium chloride has one magnesium atom, and the atomic weight for magnesium is 24.3 grams per mole. Now, you're probably wondering why I wrote grams per mole when in the first example I wrote atomic mass units. Is atomic mass unit equal to grams per mole? So for any element, its atomic mass in AMU is equal to the weight of one mole of that element in grams. And so due to the use of the same reference substance in defining the atomic mass unit and the mole, AMU and molar mass for any substance is numerically equivalent. So let me just give you one quick example. One water molecule, H2O, weighs approximately 18 atomic mass units. And one mole of water molecules weighs approximately 18 grams. All right, so now we can write this in grams per mole, and we want to do that specifically for this kind of problem because we're going to use molar mass to convert from mass to moles, and so we need this to be in units of grams per mole so things can cancel out appropriately and we can get our final answer in the units that we desire. So one magnesium atom has an atomic weight of 24.3 grams per mole. We have two chlorine atoms, all right? One chlorine atom has an atomic weight of 35.5 grams per mole. When we multiply that by two, we're gonna get 71 grams per mole. Now, all we have to do is add up these two quantities, and when we do that, we're gonna get a molar mass of 95 
0.3 grams per mole for magnesium chloride. Now we can go ahead and take the information we're given, which is the mass in grams, and convert it to moles by dividing by dividing by molar mass. So you can write this like so, 9.53 grams over 95.3 grams per mole. You can also write it in a different way that maybe is a little more intuitive. It's different for everybody, so I'm gonna erase this and show you another way to do it. This is what I prefer because I always align numbers so that the units cancel out. I would start by writing 9.53 grams, and then we just figured out that our molar mass for magnesium is 95.3 grams per mole, and we're gonna divide by this number, so grams goes in the bottom, all right, per one mole, Grams cancel out. We're going to get our final answer in units of mole. And look at that. You're doing the same number calculation here, numerical calculation. It's just written slightly different. You pick whatever you prefer. Anyways, the answer is going to be, if you plug this into your calculator, 0 0.10 moles of magnesium chloride. This is also a really easy calculation because you have approximately very similar numbers here. You just have in the denominator an order of magnitude greater. So you have 9.53 in the numerator, 95.3 in the denominator. That is about like 10% of the denominator. The numerator is about 10% of the denominator. Therefore, that's an easy calculation of 0 0.1 moles of magnesium chloride. Wonderful. Now that we solved these two practice problems, let's go ahead and move into our next topic on equivalence. Now listen, I know the way that I say equivalence sounds suspiciously close to equivalence, but bear with me. I'll try to use captions in this segment to make sure that we do not misinterpret anything. Now the concept of equivalence is crucial in the context of, say, acid-base chemistry and redox reactions. Equivalence refers to the moles of a specific species of interest typically seen in these types of chemical reactions. So for example, in an acid-base reaction, an an equivalent might represent the amount of an acid or base that can donate or accept one mole of hydrogen ions. In a redox reaction, an equivalent might represent the amount of a substance that can donate or accept one mole of electrons. Now the number of equivalents is determined by asking how many moles of the species of interest will be produced or consumed by one mole of a given compound. So in other words, equivalence is how many moles of the thing we're interested in, protons, electrons, ions, will one mole of a given compound produce. So for instance, let's look at hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid produces one mole of hydrogen ions per mole of hydrochloric acid. Therefore, one mole of hydrochloric acid corresponds to one equivalent of hydrogen ions. On the other hand, sulfuric acid produces two moles of hydrogen ions per mole of sulfuric acid. And so one mole of sulfuric acid corresponds to two equivalents of hydrogen ions. Now something else that we should discuss is the gram equivalent weight. This is defined as the amount of a compound measured in grams that produces one equivalent of the species of interest. And to calculate the gram equivalent weight, you have to divide the molar mass of the compound by the number of equivalents that the compound produces. So mathematically, it's expressed like so. Gram equivalent weight is equal to molar mass over the number of equivalents. So this is the number of equivalents produced by one mole of the compound. So for example, the molar mass of sulfuric acid is approximately 98 grams per mole, and it produces two equivalents of hydrogen ions. And so its gram equivalent weight would be 98 grams per mole over two equivalents of hydrogen ions, and this would give us about 49 grams per equivalent. Now, to find the number of equivalents of a substance present in a given mass of the compound, we can use now this equation. This equation equivalence is equal to mass of compound over gram equivalent weight. 
This calculation allows chemists to determine how much of a compound is needed to achieve a desired amount of the species of interest, facilitating precise stoichiometric calculations in these chemical reactions. And so understanding the concept of equivalence and how to calculate them is really essential for accurately predicting the outcomes of acid-base and redox reactions, and we're going to get to those in chapters 10 and 11. Now with that, another important and related term here is normality. Normality is a measure of concentration and it's given in the unit's equivalence per liter. Now on the MCAT, it is most commonly used for the hydrogen ion concentration. And so one normality solution of an acid is going to contain a concentration of hydrogen ions equal to one mole per liter. What about if it was two? Well, then the acid contains a concentration of hydrogen ions that's equal to two moles per liter. Now, we have an equation for the conversion from normality to molarity. This is given as follows. Molarity is equal to normality divided by N. And again, N here is the number of equivalents produced by one mole of the compound. Again, this is going to be extremely helpful when we talk about acid-base reactions down the line, but I wanted to introduce it early on. With that, let's go ahead and just jump into some example problems. This first example says, what is the gram equivalent weight of sulfuric acid. Now, sulfuric acid is H2SO4. And if you don't know that, that's totally okay. One of the topics in this chapter is nomenclature. So we're going to go over the rules for nomenclature, and you will definitely know this by the end of the chapter. Now, the question asks us to calculate gram equivalent weight for sulfuric acid. And the expression for gram equivalent weight is molar mass over n, where n is the number of particles of interest that's produced or consumed per molecule of the compound in the reaction. So the first step that we're going to do is we're going to calculate the molar mass. We're going to need that for the calculation of the gram equivalent weight. And we can do this by summing up the atomic weights of all the atoms in sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid has two hydrogen atoms. Each hydrogen atom is one gram per mole. Sulfuric acid has one sulfur atom, and sulfur has an atomic weight of 32.1 grams per mole. And sulfuric acid also has four oxygen atoms, and oxygen atom has an atomic weight of 16 grams per mole. If we add this all up, we're going to get an atomic weight of 98.1 grams per mole of sulfuric acid. Wonderful. So we figured out the numerator. What about the denominator? So our next step is to identify the equivalence, and specifically the equivalence of the protons or hydrogen ions here, because that's what's transferred in acid-base reactions. The number of protons in sulfuric acid is 2. And so now we can put this all together. Our molar mass is in the numerator, so 98.1 grams per mole of sulfuric acid over the number of equivalents for hydrogen ions or protons. That's going to be 2 moles of protons per mole of sulfuric acid. And this is an easy calculation. It's just 98.1 divided by 2. That's going to get us 49.05 grams per mole of hydrogen ions or protons. Great. Let's do the second question. This one says, what is the normality of a 2 molar magnesium hydroxide solution? Now, when we were discussing this topic, we had an expression to calculate molarity from normality. Molarity was equal to normality divided by n. All right, again, where n is the number of particles of interest produced or consumed per molecule of the compound in the reaction. So what we need to do now is shift this around to actually solve for normality because we're given molarity in the question and we can easily figure out n here. We can easily figure out the number of equivalents. So normality then is going to be equal to 
molarity multiplied by n. Now, molarity we're given, this is equal to 2 molar. And the number of equivalents here, there are two hydroxide ions in magnesium hydroxide. So for each molecule of magnesium hydroxide, there are two hydroxide ions, which is the equivalent of interest because magnesium hydroxide is a base. So considering all that, what we're going to be doing here to calculate normality is multiplying the molarity, 2 molar, by the number of equivalents, which is two, two equivalents of hydroxide ions per mole of magnesium hydroxide. And that's going to give us four normality for magnesium hydroxide. And that's how we solve the second example. Now with that, we can move into objective two, which we'll actually start in the next video. So we're going to end our lecture here for today. I hope this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.